So today I'm really pleased to say we have Kalu Fox um, joining us and uh, talking about his work. He earned his doctorate in genome sciences in 2016 at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, he then moved to UCSD as a um, postdoctoral fellow and um, uh, awarded by NIH and I think the UC Chancellor's Postdoctoral Fellowship. Um, and so I look forward to hearing about his work today and I'll let you take it away. All right, thank you so much and thank you for having me. I had honestly planned on coming to Arizona, but- um, Oh, I forgot to say you're now an assistant professor at UCSD oh, yeah. in the Department of Anthropology. That's right. That's, That's right. an important bit. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, I yeah, just like Anne said, I just started. Uh, it's very interesting. It's a lot of fun. And it's just crazy, you know, to begin as assistant professor in the middle of a pandemic. So, you know, that's uh, always very interesting. I had intended to come and visit everyone and give this talk in person. And unfortunately, that just couldn't be the case. Uh, but today is the day after Earth Day, so I figured, hey, why not, you know, think about Earth Day, because it's so close to that. And uh, I put up this cartoon because it's pretty funny, and it just says, this is our Earth Day 2020 report, and we've got less industrial pollution, there's less air pollution from cars, less noise pollution from airports, and, and a lot less uh, litter on the streets, and it all took a global pandemic to shut it down. So today's talk is going to focus on one very specific question, and that is how the environment has shaped our genomes in all of these unique and beautiful ways. And I love this photo of this uh, individual in the Himalayas looking over at some of the largest mountains in the world, and you can see that we have identified genetic mutations that allow humans to thrive at, at higher altitudes. And we know that there are a number of groups working on high altitude adaption. Um, but because we're so close to Earth Day, we also know that 24,000 pounds of trash and four bodies were removed from Everest this year alone. So reflecting on the way that we, that the environment has shaped our genomes, we're, always, we're also shaping the environment at this point in time. Um, oh, whoops. Can you guys see that? Okay, everybody. Um, yes. And, okay, good. Um, so, and we're shaping the environment in these unique ways. And here I've put an individual that, uh, um, whoa, that's weird. Uh, in, you know, Indonesian divers have, you know, apparently evolved larger spleens to hunt underwater. That's another way in which the the genome has shaped our, or our, the environment has shaped our genomes. And then, you know, I live in San Diego. I'm uh, from Hawaii originally, huge fan of the ocean and ocean health and surfing. And we have dumped between 4.8 and 12.7 million tons of plastic uh, into the ocean each year. Now, the reason I mentioned these two kind of questions is because one of them is not real. And one of those, it, and what I mean by that is, one of the ways in which the environment has shaped our genomes is very different and it's not real. Uh, so either it's high elevation adaption or it's low elevation adaption. And usually, you know, I'd like to kind of somehow take a poll, but I don't know if I could do a poll from here, but I just want somebody to chime in and say, which one do you guys think, maybe Anne, which one do you think is more realistic? Well, most of the time we live at lower out at altitude. So adaptation is for that norm. But then when we move up, it changes. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's interesting. And I think like one thing that's going on is that there are like these causative relationships that we're starting to identify in the human genome. And some of them are just so stories and some of them are real. And today I want to talk about a number of methods that we can use to investigate and go beyond correlation to causation and ways that we can attempt to do that. So I, uh, 
And that is why the title of today's talk is Rewriting Human History and Empowering Indigenous Communities with Genome Editing Tools. And so I'll talk about some of the new projects that are coming out of my laboratory um, and collaborations where we're looking at those sorts of things. Um, I, you know, originally I'm, I'm from Hawaii, like I said, and we have a saying in Hawaii, Ika va mamua, ka va mahope. And this means walking backwards into the future. And I like this idea because it's, it, it's like this idea that we are able to observe our diaspora using the human genome. We're able to observe our migratory roots via human genetic variation and all of the trends and things that we can uh, sort of understand. And people create stories and they narrativize many of these mutations. And a lot of them make sense and some of them don't. And we're gonna go over a handful of those stories in the way that we're testing those today. Um, a little background on me. I started off as an archeologist. Uh, I went to University of Maryland and I worked in historical archeology span and I mostly uh, for a couple of summers was working at the Y House Plantation where Frederick Douglass lived as a slave and taught himself to read and write. And it was a really important foundational experience for me because I got to see the many ways in which we use data to repatriate material culture and history and how powerful data can be in the way that we prioritize the lives and histories of, of marginalized communities. In this case, Frederick Douglass is probably the most influential American ever. If you haven't read his, the new biography on him, it's exceptional. It recently won a Pulitzer Prize. And it really got me thinking about how we use data to repatriate the past. Um, I then went on to the National Institutes of Health where I worked as a research fellow at the Center for Research on Genomics and Global Health. And we did a number of things, including data analysis for genome-wide association studies. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with how these work, so I won't belabor that. But just to say that we had an intense focus though um, before it was cool on minority health. And we really were one of the first groups in the world to prioritize GWAS and human genetic variation studies in marginalized communities. And one of the studies we worked on really changed the way I thought about genomics. Um, and it was a project working on something called podoconiosis or mossy foot syndrome. And what we learned and looked at was that there are individuals in a specific area in Ethiopia that develop this podoconiosis or non filarial elephantiasis of their feet, mostly because they're working in fields uh, through different forms of agriculture, farming, and there are micro pieces of glass or obsidian in the soil. And so they were having immune system reactions to the actual uh, tiny pieces of glass. Now, what's interesting about this is that only a subset of the people in that region actually developed this elephantiasis, meaning that it might have been heritable. And indeed, it turned out to be heritable. Um, but another thing that always fascinated me about this is not only was this a gene environment interaction, um, and there was a very successful paper from the postdoc who I was working under at the time, it was published in New England Journal of Medicine, um, and they found a really solid hit on, you know, HLA related hit. But uh, it also, there was a cultural element to it too, because there was stigmatization of those that had the disease and those people were then being intimate with other people ha who had the disease. So there was sort of a, a runaway effect in the minor allele frequency. And there were so many interesting factors in this, but it got me thinking about genomics and minority health and health disparities and gene environmental interactions in a totally different way. Um, I then went on to graduate school, as Anne said, at the University of Washington, where I revisited uh, some very classic population genetics genes, including the ABO gene, where we, uh, as a graduate student, we discovered structural variation in ABO in African communities. So we were looking at read depth based algorithms and actually determined a number of people that had the ABO deleted 
Um, and that hadn't been seen before uh, at this resolution using these tools. And it was pretty cool. And it again, got me really thinking about what it means when you know you can look at the most studied gene of all time and find new and novel variation that hadn't been seen before. I also developed a number of algorithms and uh, things like this to impute and infer blood type in uh, archaic hominids and other populations of people. And it was a really good tune up in a way to learn about human genetic variation and the foundations of population genetics. Um, Cause no gene is more famous than ABO in that sense. Um, and one of the reasons why we were able to find this totally novel form of structural variation in ABO, specifically in the Yoruba and Luya populations that hadn't been seen before, is because the vast majority of human genetics has focused on one population of people. And I put this sort of meta-analysis of these different uh, looks at kind of over time, how our field has prioritized genome-wide association data from European populations versus other populations. So starting with this giant meta-analysis in 2005 to 2009, uh, looking at 1.7 million samples and 97, or sorry, 96% of those focused on your individuals of European ancestry. Moving on from 2005 to 2016, you know, we scale up to around 35 million samples and, you know, there seems to be a little bit of progress in 20% individuals not of non-European ancestry. Now I should caution you that the majority of that 20% <clears throat> actually featured individuals of Han Chinese ancestry. Then we moved from 2005 to 2018 and it really looked like things are, are regressing and going back to kind of business as usual. Um, there's a lovely site that you can um, visit to actually look at a lot of the adjustments in these in, in real time. But what this brings up is that if we are to chart a future of predictive and preventative medicine that's going to include all people, then the science that we do should really reflect the full spectrum of human genetic variation. Um, I live in California and these numbers, 88%, for example, does not reflect the variation that we see and the diversity that we see every day in our state, which is the largest state in America, the fifth largest economy. So you get where I'm going with this. There is a huge bias in the types of data that we've developed. And you know many of the, the algorithms that we use to evaluate this data and many of the people who are uh, actually designing the algorithms themselves. Um, so it just points to um, some serious issues with equity, but it also, allows individuals to develop just so stories. And I uh, love these ideas about just so stories and they were kind of popularized by Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewinton some time ago in 1979. I wasn't even born yet, but I draw inspiration from that. Um, and they are really based on this book from Ro Roger Kipling, Rudyard Kipling from 1901, where he wrote these children's stories to explain to his daughter, you know, why was the elephant's nose so long? And maybe because of alligator kind of, you know, stretched it out while it was drinking water and little stories like this. And Gould and Lewinton, you know, argue that this is how you develop adaptionist narratives around data. Um, and if you're interested in that, I, I really uh, challenge you to check out that paper. It's really cool. But I see these just so stories and these adaptionist narratives spring up all over the place in population genetics today. Um, and I want to point out some of those examples. Um, one of those really famous examples that I uh, took issue with is from a long time ago, and it's called the thrifty gene hypothesis or the thrifty genotype hypothesis. And reason why I took issue with this is one, it was created by and popularized by uh, an individual at the University of Michigan named um, James Neal. And Neal uh, came up with this idea at a time and it was and it was sort of um, motivated by this idea that like the Polynesian diaspora came from the opposite direction that we came from South America on boats and helplessly ended up in, you know, 
all of all of the island archipelagos that we discovered and thrived in and live in today. And obviously that was the wrong direction. We didn't come from there. We came, you know, out of Asia. Uh, so it's very interesting that this was used to kind of popularize that narrative. And the way the narrative works is that there is this active lifestyle that indigenous people, for example, had prior uh, to, you know, some of these long navigational and migration events, there was a bit of, of feast and famine lifestyle that was going on and feast and famine cycles, which increased the allele frequency of genes that might have been involved in hypercaloric storage. And then we move into sort of a modern lifestyle, like I'm sitting right here talking to you today on Zoom, and those mutations don't necessarily serve the same purpose. They predispose you to hypercaloric storage, which predisposes you to metabolic disease, such as type 2 diabetes and obesity, which we know are uh, really high in Polynesian and other uh, Indi uh, sorry, um, indigenous communities. Um, and we can look at a number of these kind of globally adaptive traits, and some of them make more sense than others. And here you can see this CRE BRF gene. I've kind of highlighted it uh, uh, with this dotted circle. And recently, a gene called CRE BRF was discovered in Polynesia, that uh, in Samoan specifically, that um, investigators highlighted as a a thrifty gene. Now, what was interesting about this gene is that it looks like it predisposes to a higher incidence of obesity but protects against type 2 diabetes and if you know anything about metabolic disease that is not the relationship you expect to see you expect to see a linear relationship between type 2 diabetes obesity and hypertension so as one goes up you expect to see the others go up as well so this gene was very curious um, for for that reason um, but i really like this map um, because it, it kind of highlights many of the adaptive traits and narratives that were um, created over time, including high elevation. You see many of the blood group genes there, the MNS, the ABO, um, you know, skin color pigmentation, this FDS uh, gene region uh, that was discovered in the Greenlandic Inuit, um, EGLN1 obviously associated with high elevation. And many of these 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 narratives and stories that people people spin out based on correlation and not much causality. Um, uh, and if you're interested in this, I recommend checking out this review from 2015 or 2016. I don't, I don't remember. Um, and this is kind of a follow up that we did and published in the in the, the journal genes. And we looked at a number of these kind of classic genes that are under selection. Um, and indicated in human adaption. FADS1 I mentioned, HBB and its association with sickle cell anemia and malaria, EGLN1. Um, and, then, and then one of the other ones, PDE10A that was uh, um, discovered and associated with breath holding diving for thousands of years and increased spleen size and elevated levels of T4 thyroid. Now, there was no real functional follow-up to this. Um, and I challenge you guys to check that out and tell me that you think that's good science. Um, in, in some of the other genes like CREBRF, uh, the proposed reason why this mutation uh, and, and, and gene under selection in Polynesia is there is because it's repeated feast and famine cycles and that it provides protection against type 2 diabetes and susceptibility to obesity. Now that's really interesting and I think there's some serious just so claims around this gene. So the observation in this case is that variation in the CRE BRF gene is found in individuals who are obese. The finding is that thrifty, their, their language not mine, thrifty point mutations in CRE BRF predisposed to obesity yet they protect against type two diabetes. And that is from a piece from Minster et al in, in, two, in 2015 in, in Nature Genetics. But what I think the just so claim here is that the selective force that maintained this thrifty allele in Polynesia 
is related to scarcity of calories during the Austronesian diaspora. Now, as a Hawaiian person, I can tell you that our voyaging practices as the you know, greatest sailing and navigating culture in history, um, we definitely had food on the boat. Even in the Moana movie, they had pigs and chicken on the boat. So I'm not, in sh I'm not sure where this idea around scarcity of calories came along. We brought with us uh, poi, taro, um, sweet potato, turmeric, um, agricultural kind of staple foods that we call canoe plants and other things, dried fish, uh, a number of really interesting technologies and traditional food ways of preserving foods um, prior to refrigeration, obviously. Mm. So, so you can see how like you can build a narrative around something, but you don't have all of the data and you can actually create a story that panders towards an adaptionist narrative. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about how this happens and ways that we can test it. So obviously, the media loves this, you know, the Japan Times loves sumo wrestling. Um, a number of their champions come from Hawaii, Samoa and other places. And they say that this is the gene that may benefit sumo giants. They say that this is uh, Gizmodo said, this is how a powerful obesity gene helps Samoans conquer the Pacific. Um, and again, when you look at our, our migratory sort of accomplishments and the way we came out of Taiwan into the Philippines, Bismarck Archipelago, um, through Melanesia, and then into what a lot of people call the original moon shoot, um, in, in, and finding the, the, the Polynesian islands and all these archipelagos. I mean, this truly is remarkable. And it relied on the development of some very sophisticated um, scientific methods and technologies, including and not limited to uh, utilizing the celestial sphere to navigate probably thousands of years ago before Ferdinand Magellan had claimed that the, the earth was uh, uh, spherical. Um, it, you know, bird migration patterns, wind, wind patterns, and, you know, a really, really sophisticated ecological metadata that allowed us to get to where we did. It wasn't by accident. Um, but, you know, there are some data that indicate that we do have really high rates of obesity and type two diabetes. And some of these nations have some of the highest rates of obesity in the world. Um, a lot of this data though is under fire because it's mostly based on BMI. And, you know, being a Hawaiian person, I can tell you, we kind of like start off at size extra large and then we go up from there, you know? So um, a lot of this data might be, might be uh, sketchy as well, but there is a, real true fact that we have some some issues with metabolic disease. So that kind of doubles down on the narrative that Minster et al. were uh, propagating through that paper. And so you just kind of look at uh, their Manhattan flock from their paper. You can see that they found a G to an A nucleotide substitution with a change in, in uh, the 457th amino acid. CRE BRF lives on chromosome 5. Um, and then here are kind of a look at some of some of the data from that. If you have, you know, two copies of the mutation and two protein changes, then it looks like it's going to have a significant effect on your body weight. This is the one that's very interesting is the effect on, uh, for the odds ratio on the effect on disease risk. And you can see if you have, you know, two copies of this particular Samoan specific quote unquote thrifty mutation, then your odds of developing type two diabetes are significantly lower, which is very interesting. Um, what do we actually know about this gene kind of prior to this study and many other studies? We know it lives on chromosome five. We know it's around 30,000 base pair with nine exons. We know there's evidence of positive selection in this gene. We know that there is a disease association based on the way that they've designed these GWAS it's associated with higher leptin levels, also very interesting. Um, and then there is the mechanism itself. It's expressed in virtually all tissues. Krebs proteins are linked to mitochondrial function and metabolism, and it's involved in inflammation, which I think is very, very interesting. Um, and we're following up th with that and uh, kind of get to that towards the end here in the future directions. Um, but one of the other questions you have to ask is, does the CREBRF allele exist elsewhere in Polynesia? 
Turns out it does. Uh, collaborators of, of mine um, followed up and showed that that's very much the case. You can see when we look at the Nomad <clears throat> PopGen database that this mutation basically doesn't exist anywhere else in except Polynesia and it's found in many other places in Polynesia, including um, both mainland Maori, uh, Cook Island Maori, Samoans, and American Samoa, Tongans, um, and you get the picture definitely found in Hawaii and, and other areas. Uh, so that was really interesting because it's not just specific to Samoa, it's now found throughout and, and it is ubiquitous amongst Polynesians. And recently it was discovered in Chamorro population in Guam. So how do we properly characterize the effects of these mutations? People are building narratives, calling this a thrifty mutation, and they don't really have the functional data to back that up. So for my postdoc, the thing that I was really interested in was actually finding a systematic way to develop technologies and utilize methods that would allow me to reverse engineer these mutations in the appropriate physiological cell line. And that's exactly what we did. So this is sort of a pipeline of the ways that we can do culturally sustainable research and build narratives and test and empower indigenous peoples. We first start by interacting with communities and engaging and building relationships. Um, we avoid um, behavior that is extractive, if you will. Um, then we identify mutational variants, perform various sorts of data mining techniques. We introduce mutations into in vitro and in vivo model systems, and then we use functional readouts. And that's kind of like the global perspective on what we're doing here. And I'm going to explain how each of these things sort of work. So there are many ways that people have traditionally done um, functional assays and, you know, and I just put this kind of table up here as a comparison of many of the different techniques. So you have harvesting cells from patients, you have overexpression, and then you have this new emergence in various uh, forms of genome editing and precision genome editing techniques. And, you know, they vary in their cost effectiveness, their time effectiveness, the way that you can make valid comparisons and the potential to study non-coding variation. And you can see that there's a range of ways that we can test particular types of variation. In this case, we're talking about testing single nucleotide variants um, and, and a very particular sort of nucleotide transition. But I wanted to show you there are many different ways that people have been doing this historically and, and sort of before I expose you to what we're doing now. Um, and the tools we're using um, are base editing tools and these are precision genome editing tools. And there are a number, a sort of suite of these tools that exist um, I was lucky enough to do a postdoc with Alexis Comor here at UCSD, and she had created the first uh, base editors um, while she was in Boston. But there are a suite of them now. Again, if you're interested in this and thinking about ways to apply them to your own projects, um, please check out the paper we published in Genes, and you can feel free to reference our work. I think it's a pretty good review of the limitations of many of the tools and the tools that are sort of starting to emerge. Um, the newest kind of suite of base editors are called prime editors. Uh, we featured them in that piece as well. Uh, but for the sake of this talk, I'm going to talk about the two base editors that we've been using for this CRE BRF project. One of them is called a CBE editor and one of them is called ABE editor and they have really high efficiency in comparison to some of the other genome editing techniques such as HDR. Um, and you should know that these base editors do have limitations and that they can only make certain nucleotide transitions. So in this case, for example, a CBE can, you know, make transitions from a G to an A and a C to a T and, and, and the ABE is down there and so on. Uh, so. I just want to kind of go through and flow through the method aspect of how this actually works with another project where we were using an ABE to generate a specific amino acid change in the YH uh, gene, which has been associated with different cancers. Um, we start by transecting, transfecting cells with our base editor, um, and that involves a fair amount of cloning. Um, pretty basic techniques that have been uh, publicly available for some time. 
Um, then we do, you know, genomic DNA extraction from PCR amplification. We then Sanger sequence with the gene of interest for base uh, editing activity. And this is kind of a nice feature because Sanger sequencing is much, much sequence, uh, cheaper uh, at this scale than next generation sequencing. And you can see the signature of that uh, potential base edit and activity um, using a kind of uh, population of cells rather than having to flow and, and, and whatnot later, which I'll, sh I'll show you. Um, then we transfect the cells with the base editor and the sgRNA, the guide RNA itself. We're using a, a GFP approach in this case. Then we uh, sort into 96 wool plates and we clone, clonally expand and grow isogenic cell lines that include those mutations. Um, so again, we are clonally expanding, we're growing our cells out, we're trying to think about and sequence which potential isogenic cells exist. And finally, we look using sequencing and we can see when there's no edits, when there are homozygous edits, and when there are heterozygous edits in that location. So depending on what you want, uh, you'll have a population of cells that include those edits. Um, here is some follow-up data and confirmation of the specific, someone specific G2NA mutation that we discussed in exon five of CREVRF, which was the one that was discovered in the paper. So you get the picture here. We're utilizing precision base editing tools to introduce mutations and create isogenic cell lines and then evaluate their function. In this case, we used a, a CBE editor and we're able to do this uh, fairly cheaply with some pretty high efficiency. Now, in comparison to what you would pay at Synthego, for example, where they're charging, I think something like $20,000 for a knock-in cell line, I can tell you that this was an order of magnitude cheaper at least uh, to develop. Um, and then you can move forward and you can start asking some really interesting questions. Um, you can begin to really investigate the question of is C CREBRF a thrifty gene? Um, can we test for things like insulin sensitivity? Can we follow up with some of these interesting leads that we've had in the world of inflammation? What about running different metabolomic protocols and methods and assays? Um, and these methods can be easily adapted to gain insight into the potential role of other candidate genes that are involved in obesity. Now, obviously, different cell lines are, are you know, have their challenges and obstacles for editing. You know, fat cell lines are notoriously hard to work with. Same thing with liver cell lines, um, brain. But um, in thinking about the way that we can eventually begin to functionally investigate many of these mutations. I think that that has to be the new status quo and standard when you're producing papers in the population genetics world. Because if you're just basing this and the claims that you're creating on a correlation, that's not the truth. You know, there's a correlation between murder rates and selling ice cream, right, famously. But, they're, but, but that doesn't mean that they're actually related. Um, and I think it comes at a really important time. I'm just highlighting some work in the way that population genetics um, in Puerto Rico and the Caribbean was, was used to uh, sort of repatriate and think, and think about the language we use in repatriating history and the language and the way that our biases affect the way we create narratives. So in 2001, you can see that it's something about rebuilding the genome of a hidden ethnicity and how the Taino community had gone extinct. And then in 2019, you can see comparisons and cross sections of both modern um, Caribbean populations from Puerto Rico with uh, ancient ones. Um, this is my friend Maria's work. And you can see how different the narrative that comes out it says how ancient DNA can help recast colonial history. So there's a lot to the way we create narratives. There's a lot of the tools that we use to do this, including genomic technologies, but they should always be used in consort with uh, oral histories, historical understandings, 
linking them to archaeology, linking them to linguistic research, and connecting them and embedding those threads to make something much stronger. Um, there's also something that's deeply concerning to me, uh, and I think we need to talk about this, and I'm happy to field questions on this afterwards, but this mutation, the CREBRF mutation that is the subject of this talk today, has been um, non-Polynesian scientists have filed a potential patent claim, a global patent claim around this mutation. And that is deeply concerning to me because there are in, in you know, people that are interested in monetizing and commodifying human genetic variation that is found in indigenous communities. And that is a very interesting prospect in a time where you know, we have transitioned from an economy where the number one commodity on planet Earth now is data. Uh, it was oil in 2018, it is now data. And genomic data is worth a lot of money. And so as we build projects with indigenous communities and we start to think about ways that we can commodify this and ways that this information becomes a resource, I think we need to have hard, long talks about what the potential use and misuse of genetic information really is. Um, and that's why myself and other colleagues are really interested in the new field of indigenous data sovereignty. Uh, we recently published a review on this in particular in, the, in Nature Genetics Reviews. I encourage you guys to read it, cite it um, in every grant that you guys put out. Uh, but, but it's you know, fundamentally, it really comes down to building trust, enhancing accountability, improving equity, and this kind of leading to this greater diversity and, and inclusion in the way we treat data that is derived from indigenous communities of people. Um, and we fundamentally had kind of three ideas that, that, we, that we focused on in this review, and it was how to recognize indigenous rights and interests in raw data and digital sequence information within an open data environment how we share DSI and collaborate around ethical issues and use in different ways, um, including um, consistent with, with uh, existing community protocols, and how do we negotiate equitable outcomes from the use of DSI, including commercial, um, you know, commercialization and commodification. Um, and this is a really a growing field, and you can look at some of the research that's coming out of Regeneron and they're really thinking about stacking the deck for genetic diversity. Um, they recognize that communities of people that have unique evolutionary histories that have been sequestered over time, so to speak, or have gone through population bottlenecks offer an opportunity to fast track the research and development of pharmaceutical drugs, which are worth a lot of money. And this is from the horse's mouth. They say through DNA sequencing at Regeneron, we've identified over 100 Amish uh, KCNQ1 variant character, uh, carriers, many of whom had unexplained episodes of fainting or family members who experienced sudden death. So prioritizing a number of really interesting phenotypes and, and having that allow you to zero in on new protein domains that could potentially lead to the development of new drugs. Um, and we know that was the case with a new class of cholesterol drugs that were developed um, called pesky 9 inhibitors that involved um, collaboration with the African and African American community. Um, and we're starting to see this kind of emerge in, in, in many of the new populations that are being sequenced. This was uh, from February, first genomic study of schizophrenia and African people turns up broken genes, meaning new networks of genes allow us to zero in on new pathways for the development of drugs that are involved in neurodevelopmental disorders, which is a giant market as well. Um, I'd be safe to say, um, I don't think that this community is going to receive a cut of the royalties or the intellectual property at this point in time. Um, but that doesn't mean that benefit sharing models and the Nagoya protocol don't exist. Here is a feature in November 2019 looking at rooibos tea profits and those profits being shared with indigenous communities, the San and the, and the Khoi communities. Um, and this was kind of a monumental um, move forward in terms of benefit sharing. There are also 
other communities uh, where, for example, in the resource extraction of diamond mining, uh, we see in Botswana that a new diamond mining company has created a benefit sharing plan to actually create a circular economy and reinvest 5% of their uh, profits into health programs, education programs, and so on. So this stuff is happening. And I think it is a huge avenue for this developing ecosystem around data as a resource. Um, and then this is from my own work. It's coming out shortly and it is uh, called The Illusion of Inclusion. And I was looking at the All of Us program and evaluating whether or not their data restriction access and collaborations and partnerships and the way they're engaging indigenous communities are effective. Who is that going to serve? What do we see when we look at the data flow, the collection, storage, and access to this data? Um, Cur the current research and development protocol in a, in a program like the All of Us program, which is planning to sequence 1 million people in the United States of America, where they plan to over sample for um, minority populations, um, there are no real protections for those communities of people if they are per to participate. That data will become aggregated, harmonized, and mined by Big Pharma immediately as it uh, hits the market. So some of the solutions we can think about here are involve um, uh, many different benefit sharing, um, equitable benefit sharing protocols. And some of them I've outlined here where we're th thinking about a collective trust or community trust model, and then an individual interest or fractional model. Um, and many of these models are being used elsewhere and some of them are even being used in the genomics community. I know the individual interest and fractional model is being used by Luna DNA here in um, and and they could pave the path forward for equitable benefit sharing programs um, and I'd be happy to talk more about that um, but ultimately I believe in grassroots community research I believe in self-governance where communities are in control of their data and finally to bring it back to the CRE BRF example kind of here in the end um, uh, working with collaborators, we are seeing that that uh, the Maori community is way more comfortable calling the CRE BRF mutation the um, the tall, dark, and handsome gene, not the thrifty gene. We're seeing a really high percentage or frequency of this mutation in uh, Polynesian professional rugby players. So it's it's found in professional athletes. I don't know if that makes them thrifty but it definitely makes them uh, elite athletes. So that's very interesting. Um, and who knows what we'll find in our communities in the future. I just hope that the, the narratives that we develop uh, uh, around mutations that are private or rare, private to Polynesian populations of people uh, serve our community and are, are responsible and culturally sustainable. Um, and you don't have to go all the way to Polynesia to find island people. This is one of the largest gatherings of island people in the United States of America here in Southern California, where a large part of our diaspora lives. Um, and we're asking questions about our own community's health here in America. Um, finally, I just want to go back to this, let the people come to you model. There is, uh, there was a, a paper that came out in nature in 1998 and it was a collaboration between investigators at, I believe, the University of Otago and the Maori community. And the Maori community reached out to these investigators and they said, we have really high rates of gastric cancer. We think it's inherited. And they were able to identify, uh, then the, through this collaboration, they were able to identify a new gene that benefited prediction and prevention of gastric cancer in all populations of people. Um, and targeted treatment for that community. And they even included many of the members of the Maori community in the author list. And I think this speaks to like the potential to create culturally sustainable collaborations in the way we engage indigenous people. And the playbook has been out there for some time. Um, we put out our own playbook, um, myself and a number of individuals published this 
um, enhancing ethical genomic frameworks in nature communications. Feel free to um, check that paper out as well. Uh, it's a pleasure to get to publish with them. There's a rare picture of all of us together at one of our SING workshops, the Summer Institute for Indigenous People and Genomics. Um, and we just had our first SING Indigenous Genomics Conference in uh, Waikato, Aotearoa. And this is the first Indigenous Genomics Conference to have all Indigenous speakers. And we had a number of conversations around Indigenous data sovereignty, emerging methods, policy, bioethics. And we had visitors and sponsorships from, you know, major corporations. We had a, a poster and a poster competition that was sponsored by Nature Genetics. Um, so, you know, we're trying to get our, we, we don't want this to be a moment. We want it to be a movement. And I will finally leave with this. I was going to try to uh, use this as opportunity to recruit people for the Indigenous Futures Lab Field School, which will be taking place in Moorea through the UC Berkeley and UC San Diego collaboration at the UC Gump Research Station. But unfortunately, obviously, we're in the middle of a pandemic, so that's not happening this summer. Maybe next summer. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you to all of these people who have helped me build many of these research pro uh, projects and programs, including uh, Anne and Kelly at ASU and everyone at the Stone Lab. Um, I want to thank many of the institutions that have uh, awarded me grants. I really appreciate it and I will take your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> um, so now we have time for uh, questions from the general audience and then um, in 10 or 12 minutes or so um, we will shift over to the to the class. Uh, it looks like there's one on the chat that says, um, uh, or more of a comment, I guess, the phrase just so stories is a slur that has, thank goodness, faded as more scientists become sophisticated about the history of debates, mm -hmm. about how to test evolutionary hypotheses and the many relevant methods. Mm -hmm. uh, disparaging a whole class of legitimate hypotheses is inappropriate, even when many turn out to be false. For instance, most GWASH findings. Uh, and that is from uh, Randy Nessie. Um, okay. Other, so a comment there for you and um, other. You, uh, uh, okay, okay. I, I understand where you're coming from. I think that people should have the freedom to come up with hypotheses. Um, but I also think that when they're dangerous and disparaging of the accomplishments of indigenous people that they need to be addressed directly, especially when that language and those stories become ubiquitous and they become published in major journals. It's more harmful than it is anything else. Um, and it could potentially be used to exacerbate health disparities in our community. So I don't, I, uh, that's where I'm going with that one. But thank you for your comment. Cool. Uh, other questions or comments? Perhaps I should follow up with why I said my somewhat critical comment. I enjoyed your talk, um, but Jim Neal was a good friend of mine. And I want to tell you that he had the very first journal club ever in evolutionary medicine about the thrifty genotype paper. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't an adaptationist at all. And anybody who talks about that should read his four subsequent papers, which are a model for how a scientist critiques his own hypothesis and gives up on it at the right time. Furthermore, his work on the Pima group here in Arizona was definitive, trying to figure out why they have such massive rates of obesity. And recent data show it has not too much to do with genes. It looks like much more huge obesity on this side of the border and low obesity on the other side of the border. But the most recent review suggests there may yet be some genetic factors uh, that are relevant. So I just want to defend Jim Neal. Uh, his three or four papers about that on syndrome X are really a model for how you make an evolutionary hypothesis and then critique your own hypothesis with the help from other colleagues who are doing anthropological research um, in ways that I think are very respectful of indigenous populations and offer them help with severe health medical problems. I appreciate that. And I think people should have the opportunity to make mistakes. I think that ultimately, um, 
I'm not as mad at, I, again, never met Jim Neal. Um, I read a lot of his work. I'm more mad that someone would dig up the narrative and use the language uh, in 2015, if that makes sense. So it's not necessarily an indictment on his work and the fact that we're allowed to put up hypotheses and our hypotheses are allowed to, to fail. Um, and then the idea about like, you know, obviously the re <laughs> obviously from the global health sort of perspective, I think the issues with metabolic disease are more of a lifestyle change, right? It's like if you take away people's access to land, fishing, hunting, and other things, and then you replace that with Burger King and fry bread and white rice and spam and soy sauce, of course they're gonna have higher rates of, you know, they're not gonna have the same levels of activity, um, not to mention different types of stress. I mean, these are, this is the residue and hangover of colonialism. So those are the facts. So I'm with you on that. Um, but I think we are now moving into a new era where indigenous people get to tell their own stories about the way we, in, we interpret our genomes. And that's the future. And Jim Neal's work is the past. And that's that. Really good, and appreciate that very much. Just for the final comment, Jim's work was not mainly trying to show genetic differences between populations. His work was mainly trying to show why all humans share a vulnerability to diabetes. And mm -hmm. it's been widely misinterpreted by geneticists who haven't read his work. Appreciate that. I, I Again, my critique is more of digging up a theory and then couching and planting, you know, ideas in it in 2015, so. But, uh, but I am, a, I am honestly, I think he, I never met him, but the guy had a lot of ideas, probably a brilliant person, so. I think next up, uh, question wise, is Katie Hind. Oh yeah, nice, Katie. Hey. Uh, she, you're muted, you're muted, Katie. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, oh, so thank you so much for your talk and coming uh, to present it virtually for us. It's um, sad, of course, for all the reasons why you can't be here in person. Um, I, I have, you know, so many things um, that uh, your talk inspires. And, and, um, and one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and I don't, my question doesn't have great clarity. And so I apologize for that. But yeah. coming off of one of your recent points during the q and um, I've spent a lot of time uh, because of my work in um, animal conservation and global health, um, as you pointed out, uh, you have these legacies of colonialism that put populations um, at, at huge risk um, of different metabolic disorders, other kinds of um, disease ecologies, things like that. And um, one of the things that I'm quite frustrated about is a lot of conservation science mm -hmm. um, is really, you know, very focused on um, uh, con conserving things in ways that are not uh, partnerships with indigenous or um, traditional communities and um, are thinking about it in a very cash economy colonialist way today. Mm -hmm. And um, and a lot of what's driving that, of course, is um, genetic diversity um, of conservation biologists. And so I guess I would invite you to say if you're at all interested in how these layers of understanding of genetics and in animals, including humans, and conservation and, and disrupting colonialism and building um, partnerships and having um, communities come to the researchers, become researchers, anything in that domain that you want to speak to, I'd be really interested in your thoughts. Yeah, that is, I, I often think about that too. I'm a, you know, I wanted to start off this whole thing with the homage to Earth Day. And I know that everyone here probably loves our planet so much um, and is thinking about issues around conservation. Um, the most immediate thing I think of is like, um, my partner works on gene drive research. So it's like thinking about the way in which we want to engage communities of people to try new technologies to, uh, you know, implement or trot out something like uh, gene drive mosquitoes, which are affecting, you know, endangered bird species in Hawaii. You know, being from Big Island, I can tell you that we are one of the biodiversity capitals of the world. We are, we have some of the most diverse soil profiles in the world. 
but we're also the invasive species capital of the world. So I see, I've seen a lot of failures that were, you know, um, mongooses, for example, other things, Fa you know, failure where this shouldn't, shouldn't have happened. And I think like, it's dangerous to think that you're just going to release a new gene drive technology that's going to sort of uh, bring the equilibrium and balance back to uh, e an ecosystem or ecology when that's dynamic. But there's definitely a fair amount of um, like colonial behavior in the way that people think that they're going to just, we'll go test it on an island. Like that went really well in Bikini Atoll, Henry Kissinger at all. Like I, I get it. You know, I, I think, I just think people need to be a little more, a little more cautious about like the, these ideas and myths about isolation and, and the way that we heal our environment and the, the technologies that we use. Cause fire can be used to cook a beautiful filet mignon, but it can also be used to burn down your house. So good luck. Can, can I follow up on that? Sure, uh, sure. Uh, so fantastic. So one of the things um, that we're seeing in um, in medicine is this kind of emergent idea of one health, that environmental health, animal health, and human health are all interconnected. Mm -hmm. And what I find really fascinating is that that concept is so deeply um, through everything about traditional and traditional knowledge and traditional worldviews, and yet these uh, literatures and perspectives and people haven't yet started to come together. Are you, but that's my perspective. So I'm wondering if there's, if they're seeing that starting to come together in places um, and whether or not geneticists are involved in those syntheses. Yeah, that's a great question. I do think like in Hawaii, like the guiding force that we have is called Aloha Aina. And it's more of like a philosophy or a worldview. And it is the idea that you love the land, you're a part of the land. Um, I completely agree with that. I think if we take more care of the environment, people will be healthier. Obviously, like look at our reduction in particulate in the atmosphere, just because everyone's forced to be at home. You know, um, people's, I'm sure rest, well, I'll, I'll save that, but I'm saying, I'm, I, you know, I'm sure some respiratory disorders that are related to particulate are lower, right? Um, I'm sure there are a number of different ways. This data though is going to be so valuable. The, the data set that is created um, on the backside of this sort of pause or this freeze, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. is going to be really cool. I'm really interested in, you know, and um, one of the things we're focused on in this um, through our Indigenous Futures Lab is going to be climate refugee health. Like, how, where are people going to go mm -hmm. when their home doesn't exist anymore? What types of health ailments are going to exist? Is there going to be a rebirth in leprosy? Like, I don't know. But, but uh, it's just, it's going to be interesting to forecast those things and try to provide solutions. So I'm, I can see many ways in which those things are connected. And I think the, that vantage point is really important, especially now. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Great question. Thank you. So we now have a question from uh, Maxwell. Thank you, oh, Maxwell. Oh, hi. Uh, I, uh, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for the talk. I mean, mm -hmm. very interesting talk. And I also want to report that I'm also a new faculty. In fact, I'm starting in ASU West uh, this summer. Oh, nice. So, Congratulations. So to, uh, new faculty at the time of global pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I want to ask a follow-up question uh, related to uh, the previous one uh, mm. about environmental factors. Mm. So, you know, environmental environment, you know, like mean many different things uh, to different people, right? I mean, lifestyle can be environment, uh, food consumption, food, food consumption pattern can be environment, chemical exposure can be environment. I'm just curious that uh, in your line of work uh, with the indigenous community, what is the environmental factor that you know, like that has you know, like has been looked at most, and what would what would you think that should be looked at more? Mm, that is a great question. I think there are a number of things. Um, mostly, I've been working in Polynesia, but I think one thing that really needs further evaluation is stress. I think like it's something I've been thinking about a lot how 
how it has this just, you know, okay, let me fall back. Uh, <clears throat> island people, I think, I think if you reduce stress, you have a chance of having a longer life. <laughs> you know, you're going to have more nutrition. You're going to have other, other, other things that kind of contribute to that, obviously. But I, I think it's underplayed in the ways that we can evaluate it. Things like cortisol levels, other things that like we have a grip on and are actually financially pretty easy to evaluate and their effects on gene regulation and other things. I feel like this is a really, um, it might be because I was just reading about it, but I, but I, I think it's a very interesting avenue for future development in thinking about the way it affects our health. And it's a low hanging fruit in that sense. It's emerging and it's low hanging. And those two things aren't necessarily the same. And I think it's both of those things. So, but great question, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you so much, Kaylu.